Hello everyone, uh, my name is Scott. Uh, we're here at, at the University of South Florida. Uh, this is section, uh, this is the uh, calculus uh, section two, spring uh, 2020. Uh, and we are talking about the max and min functions today. Uh, last time we talked about L'Hopital's rule um, and I was absolutely horrible. I forgot to put them on the quiz. Uh, the, uh, so we'll go over the quiz, of course, and then I'm going to go over the testing procedures, make sure everyone's comfortable with that, uh, because the test is a Saturday, uh, reminder that this at this evening at 5 p.m. is, uh, a test review, and again at, uh, another test review at, uh, uh, 7 p.m. Uh, are there any technical difficulties? Okay, so someone's reporting that they're not getting audio, um, the other person is reporting that there is audio, um, that it is now, yes, so the audio is on Twitch, um, okay, perfect, all right, so everybody's good, uh, with the technical stuff, um, so let's go over to the quiz first, and then I'll go over testing procedures, and then I will go over the min-max function, so I should actually put that right here, I'll go over testing procedures, if it's boring, uh, And then we'll go over the min-max uh, functions. All right. Are there any questions before we get started? Um, so the test reviews are 5 p.m. today and 7 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so I'll write that down. Test reviews. And the quiz to the bootleg, um, so there's supposed to be a Proctorio quiz for the bootleg. It is not up yet. I thought it was up. Um, I could have sworn I put it up, but apparently I didn't put it up. Um, or if I did, the Canvas thing eats the, eats, you know, Canvas has a tendency to eat things, so it may have eaten my quizzes. Um, I hope not. Um, it doesn't eat things once students take them, but apparently sometimes you don't you forget to hit the right save button. You know, you hit the update question, but you forget to hit the save, or you hit the save, but not the update question, and everything goes kaplooey. So, uh, Canvas quiz system kind of stinks, um, and uh, I could have sworn I did it, but apparently I didn't. So, I'm going to fix the bootleg uh, right after class. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay. So, you'll take the bootleg like you're taking all the quizzes now. But um, it should have been fixed, and it's not. So I will fix it uh, uh, by I will fix it after class. Uh, any other questions? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and go over the the quiz. I actually already posted the quiz rubric uh, just now before class uh, because it was due early this morning. Uh, so you can actually follow along with your own quiz. Uh, uh, rubric if you want to, uh, or you can follow along on here, either way. Um, but the let's go over the quiz. So this quiz, and as I said, I should have included uh, L'Hopital's rule questions on here, uh, but I didn't. Uh, uh, horrible me. Um, I changed the order of the class a little bit this time because I wanted to do L'Hopital's rule after spring break uh, because we were having this catastrophe. Um, and so I forgot completely to change the quiz. Um, again, bad me. Uh, but there are L'Hopital's rule questions on the test, even though I forgot to put them on a quiz. But I did put up some on the bootleg, so, um, I'm okay with that. Uh, and I, you did have warp assigned, so I'm okay with that. Let's talk about this. Um, so I've got, this is kind of a more typical optimization problem. The book, as I said, the book is filled with all of these examples of optimization problems, so many of them good, but stuff like Snell's Law and all these other things, and that's fine. It's very physicky, but that's fine. But um, what I want to do is I want to talk about um, these kind of economic problems, um, and this is kind of a typical one. So I've got some kind of production function, 
okay? And in order to produce my jet propelled pogo sticks for Wiley e. Coyote to, you know, hit himself in the head of Cliffs with, um, I have skilled and unskilled labor mixed together. And that's kind of pejorative, right? But I can think of skilled labor as labor with machines, uh, you know, robots with IT managers on them. And then I've got kind of unskilled labor, um, again, pejorative, but this is just basically labor that doesn't need machines. Um, uh, these are kind of how things get set up, right? I've got people that are easy to replace in one sense, that have lower marginal productivity, and I've got people that are not so easy to replace. Uh, and this is true for uh, manufacturing a bunch of things, right? If you think of a Burger King, right, I've got skilled managers, I've got the guy working the drive through who should always be paid more because the guy working the drive through is stuck working the drive through because that guy is the one that's able to make change in his head. Um, and he should be making more than the others for some reason he doesn't always. But, you know, the guy in the drive through is the guy that the manager actually trusts to do the job right. Um, so I've got skilled labor and, of course, the manager. And then I've got unskilled labor. These are the people, like, working the line, making the burgers. You know, there's a little bit of skill involved, but you can teach someone how to set, make a burger uh, on a Burger King line fairly quickly. Um, the, but the guy who maintains the fryer and the guy who maintains the machine, uh, the guy who maintains the boiler and the Burger King, this is, you know, skilled labor. Uh, so I need this mix. How do we feel about the setup for this problem? One to five. You know, after I talked about it for five minutes, which is absolutely horrible. You know, bored everybody for five minutes about the setup for this problem. Um, and the idea is I need both. So the kind of standard way to approach this problem is to say, okay, so output is fixed at a thousand. I need to make a thousand units and I want to find the cheapest way to do it. In particular, I want to find the lowest cost for doing it. Okay. So um, here I've got 1,000 equals S to the 1 half, L to the 1 half. And my cost, which is the thing I want to minimize, is 9L, right? So it's the wages I paid to the lower skilled workers plus the wages I paid for my higher skilled workers. Right. And so I've got this constraint uh, here because this is the thing where I know. And this is the thing I want to minimize. So I take my constraint function, whatever it is. And I, uh, you know, the thing that's fixed. And then these are the things that cost money. So I take this thing and I, the 1,000, I'm going to square everything here. And because it's 1,000, I don't want to write 10 to the 6th. I mean, I mean, 10 with six zeros after it. It's just, you know, boring. It, it's a nice number, right? You get to write, you know, million. I get to write million, which, you know, is fun to write when you've got friends buying M's and L's. But, you know, it's still 10 to the 6th is much more economical. So I'm going to do 10 to the 6th. So I do 10 cubed squared equals S times L, which gives me 10 to the 6th equals L over L equals S. How do we feel about that 1 to 5? The kind of taking this area thing, not the area, but the output at, at 1,000 and kind of you know, figuring out the, 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 the solving for one of the variables. And it doesn't matter which one. Okay. All right, so after I solve for my variables, I'm going to plug it into my C function, which is the one I'm trying to minimize here. I'm going to plug this into my C, and I wind up with the equation 9 pl 9L plus 36 times 10 to the 6th over L, which is 9L plus 36 times 10 to the 6th, L to the negative 1. And notice I'm using this 10 to the 6th because it's just easier to deal with. And if I do this, I'm going to take the derivative of this function, because this is what I want to optimize now. I'm going to set it equal to 0. So I want to optimize the function. I want to find out where its minimum is. I take its derivative. I get 9 minus 36 times. Now this minus here comes from the negative 1 here, right? So I do negative 1 times the whole thing, L to the negative 2, because negative 2 is negative 1 minus 1. I use the power rule. 
and I wind up, so how do we feel about taking the derivative one to five? Let's see. Oh. I think I think the the poll taker has a little lag. Okay. Uh anyway. So I'm gonna do that. And then I come up with this idea that I move this over to this side, so I add this thing to both sides. And I wind up with L squared, and then I multiply both sides by L squared and divide both sides by 9. And I wind up with L squared equals 36 over 9 times 10 to the 6th, which is 4 times 10 to the 6th. 36 over 9 is 4. Then I take the square root of both sides. I wind up with 2 times 10 to the 3rd, or 2,000 hours of unskilled labor. So how do we feel about that? Coming from this step here to this answer here for L. And then what I'm going to do is now I've got S here, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to multiply, I'm going to take my equation here. I've got 10 to the 6th over 10 cubed. That's this equation right here. And I'm going to solve for S, and I wind up with 500 hours of skill. So I sub that in. Those are my two quantities. Now, I take the second derivative test here to make sure I have a minimum. So I'm going to take the derivative of this thing right here, and I wind up, to find the second derivative, I wind up with 0. Now, that negative 2 comes in front, hits that negative 1, and becomes a positive 2. Uh, 36 times 10 to the 6th, L to the negative 3. I actually don't care if L is positive, this thing is positive. So my function, my entire function is concave down, and that means I have a minimum. I'm sorry, my, my function is concave up, and that means I have a minimum at the bottom, right? I'm concave up, so I've got a minimum at the bottom. How do we feel about that, 1 to 5? Uh, the second derivative test. I'm concave up, and therefore, right, second derivative positive, I'm concave up, therefore I have the minimum at the bottom. I'm going to write that right here. Okay. All right. So now I know I have a minimum. I'm just going to take my total cost then is uh, um, is 9L plus 36S, and I wind up with $36,000 as the total cost for producing, right, because this is 18, this is 18,000, and I wind up with 36,000 as the total cost. Um, and then I divide through by 1,000 because that's the number of unit, and I get $36 average per unit cost. So my new total cost is $36,000 uh, $36, using 500 labors of hours of skilled labor and 2,000 hours of unskilled labor, giving an average unit cost of 36. Now, last thing I'm going to do, check to make sure I actually answer the question. So I come back up here. And I go, okay, what is the minimum cost? I did that. And what is the per unit cost? Uh, that's right there. That's right there. So here's the total cost is 36000 Here the unit cost is $36. I don't care about anything else. I don't need anything else. Um, but... Um, you know, I said stuff that I didn't need to say, but I did answer the question. One to five, how do we feel about that? Problem. All right. Okay. Uh, if you want me to go over this some more, uh, I will be happy to go over these problems. 
reminder that uh, tonight at 5 p.m. is the test review. Again, tomorrow at 7, I've got, I blocked off the, basically the entire day uh, to do um, nothing but, uh, basically I blocked off the entire day tomorrow and most of Friday to do, to answer questions that you all have, except for Friday morning. Uh, remember that Friday morning, my office hours are different. I'm going to be doing Friday afternoon because of Friday morning, I have to do the discrete test. Now, there's a question about could I have used the, um, the other method, okay? And the answer is yes. So the method that I did last night, I could have used that, and here's the answer. Here's the way to do that. So here I could have picked one of the variables to drive, differentiated everything, uh, gotten the two zeros, solved both for ds over dl or dl over ds, if that's how you felt about it, and I would have solved this. So I would have solved for my optimal ratio, and then I wind up with s equals 300, l equals 2,000, and a per unit cost, and the cost is there. And then I do an endpoint check, um, right, and the endpoints are infinity for cost, so they don't, I don't care. Uh, so yes, I could have done that. Do you lose points for not taking the second derivative? You lose points if you don't show you found the minimum. Now, there were three ways to do it, right? I could do endpoint check, in which case the endpoints here are infinity. That's this answer right here. I could have done a first derivative check. I didn't do that. Or I could have done a second derivative check. And the second derivative test is right here. So I had to pick one of them. I don't care which one you did, but you had to pick one of them. Okay. Are there any other questions on this one? Okay. I see questions in chat about the test and about the test prep. I'll get to those in a moment. Um, for the moment, I just want to I want to answer questions. I mean, don't, I'm not forgetting about your questions. I'm just um, I'm doing this first. Okay. Um, all right, so let's move on to number two. Uh, so on number two here, I want to sketch a graph that's continuous. This should have been a condition. It wasn't. Uh, that satisfies the following. So the stuff I did in dark purple is the stuff I did first. So the first thing I did... When I saw this condition right here, was I drew that right there, that arrow. I saw this here. I want to be decreasing smoothly on negative infinity zero. So I wrote this note here on the bottom. Okay. Then I want to be decreasing smoothly again on two infinity. So I wrote this note on the bottom. Now, f prime of zero doesn't exist. That means there's a kink. And I wrote this note on the bottom. All right, the stuff in purple I did first. This is concave up. Uh, let's see. I've got, uh, oh, sorry, the limit here. I wrote this little arrow here. Uh, it's concave up of four infinity. I wrote that. And f prime of 2 equals 0, I've got a min or a max here. Now, because it was concave down, I actually know it has to be a maximum. Now, 1 to 5, how do we feel about interpreting what the conditions mean? And then... Once I interpreted what the conditions meant, then I wrote my thing. So the stuff in purple, the lighter purple, is what I did next. Okay? So I took my ruler and I drew this nice little straight line. It didn't have to be straight line, but I needed a kink at the end. I needed it to be decreasing. Straight lines are always easiest. Okay? And then I wrote a little kink here because on my bottom it said kink. And then I came up. And I did a local max here. So I was very careful. I kind of traced a little maximum, made sure the maximum was at 2. And then I came down. Now, here I'm going for concave down to concave up. So I'm going to draw a little... And then that I did this. Actually, what I did was I started up like this, started down like this, started up, started down, and made a meet there in the middle. Okay. 
then I wrote all these notes in green after. These were kind of for the grader kind of things, right? So I told the grader I had a local max here. That's why f prime of x equals zero. And I drew the dotted line, the dashed line. Here, I actually wrote the word kink. Here, I drew the dashes and said horizontal asymptote. And here, you'll see that I drew a tangent line that is below the curve here, but above the curve here. And that's my inflection point. So one to five, how do we feel about the drawing once I have, once I understand what to do? How do we feel about how I met the conditions? One to five. Okay. This is a little bit of a tricky graph, but it's not the, it's not, the hardest graph that we've done, but it's a little tricky. There's a lot of overlapping conditions. Uh, if you want to talk about graphs, I'll be very happy to do so. Um, uh, uh, we can do it what I want. Again, I blacked out most of the day tomorrow and uh, the afternoon on Friday just for you guys. All right, discrete guys. Well, not just for you guys. You guys have to share tomorrow with discrete, but then Friday afternoon is all you guys because the discrete people have already had their test. So they won't want to talk to me. Are there any questions about the quiz? Okay. Okay, so there don't seem to be any questions about the quiz. Any more questions about the quiz? Let's, uh, okay. So let's talk about the test. The test, and if you go on the thing, you'll see that there's a bunch of stuff. And I already saw a question right now about the uh, about the pre-assignment. So let's talk about that first. There's this test three pre-assignment that you've got on your on your thing already set up. Okay, and there was a question about the pre-assignment. Let me find that question. Um, so let's go back here. There was a question about, okay, so the test three prep pre-assignment, what is that? What I want you to do, and you can follow on here, but the big thing about this is I want you to do two things. I want you to test your proctorial connection, and I want you to print the official answer key and make everything set up. So if you click on this link, it will take you to the official answer sheet. And it's changed since last time, but not enough that you need to print it out. You can just, like, make a little notation. Okay. They, they had to change things again. Okay. It's just, it's inevitable that they want to change things. They love to change things. Um, so what you do is you print this out, or you make a nice fair copy. And there are very detailed instructions on how to make your fair copy of the answer sheet. And then what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to upload, you're supposed to write your name in the box. Okay, don't sign and write your section number. Don't sign anything yet. And then you're supposed to take your answer sheet and you're supposed to scan it. In either a scanner, you know, like on your printer, like on an all-in-one, or a page scanner, or your phone. And the point is to test your ability to get this thing up to up into the system in the proper order. Because the way that Gradescope works is it wants all of these things to be lined up. Now, for the quizzes, for the homework assignments, I've been sometimes emailing you when they're kind of messy. Um, but really, you know, there's so many, I've got 50 of you in one class, 50 of you in another. Um, I can ask one of the peer leaders or one of the graders, you know, hey, can you just, you know, rearrange the pages if they mess it up? When it comes to Saturday, we are going to have over a thousand tests. So everything, and it's not a two-page thing where it's easy to find your work if you accidentally scan the wrong page first, okay? So on the quizzes, if you accidentally scan page two as page one, it's kind of a pain, but it's easy to flip ahead. If, however, you reverse every page on the test, it's a real pain in the neck uh, for the grader to go back and fix it, especially when we're dealing with over a 1,000 of them. 
So the idea behind this is that we want to make sure, one, that you're able to upload stuff and that you're able to create a fair PDF, and two, that you're able to do it in the right order so that everything lines up with like it should be in grade scope. So that's the idea of the pre-assignment. It's just a final check to make sure everything's ready to go for Saturday. All right. Now, here's how the test is going to work. Okay. The answer sheet got updated, I think, uh, yesterday was the last time. Or, yeah, yesterday, uh, based on comments that we had from the meeting the day before. Um, and don't uh, – small changes. Okay, the points got redistributed. So just go through, if you've already got a printed answer sheet, take your printed answer sheet, take a pen, go through the one that's online now, look at the one that's on your answer sheet, the one that you have, and just kind of change the points. Nothing else changed. None of the, nothing but the point distributions changed on the answer sheet. Um, because they thought that two points per true false question was too much. Um, even when we were giving partial credit, and they wanted to give more points for the optimization problem, and then one more points for the max min problems. Okay, fine. Um, so they wanted to change it, even though we had a final version on, we were supposed to have a final version before, now we have this. Um, and this is the absolute final version. If they try to change it again, I will, you know, go ballistic at them. Uh, because we've already uploaded all the stuff to Gradescope for the answer sheets. Uh, okay, so anyway, the thing that changed, I mean, you'll see it, but, you know, this one, we gave another point to this problem. So these are the three L'Hopital rule, or are they problems? You know, one of them always has, you don't use L'Hopital's rule, because if you lose L'Hopital's rule, you get in trouble. One of them always uh, is L'Hopital's rule. Um, one of them is always something you can do two different ways. Um, and then we have absolute min, absolute max. This one got more points. It was 10, now it's 12. Uh, this is obviously the optimization problem because it's got 12 points instead of 10. Um, and all of these are just the same as they were before. Uh, any other questions about that? Okay. So, yeah, so that's the, the way the thing works. Now, here's the procedure on Saturday morning, and you have to do it on Saturday at 9 a.m., you know, eight, at 8.50. What you're going to do is you're going to log in to Discord on your phone. Here's the point. So download the app for Discord on your phone and get on it. You're going to be online on your phone so that you can hear any announcements that we make in chat. So you're going to join a chat channel. And if you look on Discord now, of course, I can't share the screen with Discord because it has your names on it. But if you look at Discord now, you'll see that there's a room called test taking. There's another room called raised hands. Okay. There is another room called special test taking. Okay which you can see now. So can everyone see those three rooms? Okay, one to five. How do you feel about the fact that there are three rooms now on Discord? So everyone look at your Discord and see it. One to five, how do we feel about that? Um, actually, it's not really a one to five, right? It's either an up or down, but whatever. Do we all see that there are these rooms on Discord? Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to join the test-taking voice chat and you're going to mute your microphone. But don't deafen yourself because you need to be able to hear. Okay, that's important. Okay, and you're going to do it on your cell phone. Now, when you have a question, you're going to join the raised hand special, uh, 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 chat. And one of the proctors, and we're going to have proctors, one of the proctors will come, and me, I'll be one of the proctors, will come and answer your question. So this could be anything. Raised hand. Hey, can I go run to the restroom? Hey, raised hand. Hey, can I uh, grab some more scratch paper? Uh, raised hand. Can I um, blah, 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 blah. You know, um, I'm having technical difficulties with something. Okay. Uh, so the idea, or I've got a question about number four here. Can you, you know, what can you tell me about it? Can you explain a little bit more? Whatever. The idea here is that it's just like you being in the auditorium, right? You raise your hand, a proctor comes and sees you. Then there's this room called special text taking, which you won't be able to see. OK, 
Okay? Matter of fact, I'm going to hide it again right now. Now, uh, dee -dee -dee, I accidentally joined it. Now, the special hand, the special test taking room is designed for people that are either they have SDS time, which is extra, or they had technical issues. Okay? So if you have technical issues or you have arranged something for me beforehand or something like that, I'll drag you myself into that room. You can't see the room unless you're in it. And uh, then you'll be able, be able to hear announcements about that stuff. Okay? So there's special rooms for, there's a special room that, you know, you're not supposed to be able to see people that are SDS now. You don't know why people are in there. Uh, but there's a special room uh, for people that have uh, uh, extra issues. Um, and you'll not be able to see that chat room unless you, you are supposed to be in it. Are there any questions about that? Now, here is why it's important that it's on your phone. Two reasons. One, Proctorio. Okay, Proctorio is not going to like the fact that you've got another browser window open or another app open in the background. Don't care. The real reason is because this is now your backup. Okay, if in the unlikely event that something happens to your setting, Something happens to your computer. Your computer crashes or whatever, or your internet cuts out. You've got a backup. This is connected, hopefully, with a different internet connection, right? You've got a 4G or 3G setup. Um, and you can jump on it, raise your hand, and say, hey, my computer just crashed. All right? And then we'll deal with it. Okay? Um, so if you don't have the app, get the app. Make sure it's on your phone. Are there any other questions about that? Yes. So it's fine if you listen. So the question is, is it fine if you listen to headphones? Yes, if those headphones are set up or connected to your phone to listen for announcements. Uh, you can also put your phone on speaker to listen for announcements. Either way works. Um, and if you want to use a headset to talk. In one sense, I'm kind of honor trusting you to be wearing headphones to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. I'm trusting that you're not doing it to listen to music or talk to each other. Um, I will have the audio. Uh, so one of the things that I haven't done correctly in in, grade, in in Proctorio so far that I found out and I'll be fixing when I upload the bootleg is that I didn't do the audio uh, sensor. Uh, I forgot to turn it on. Oops. Um, so I will be fixing that this time around. Um, so, yeah. So if you're listening to announcements or whatever, you'll be able to do it. Um, if you're being very clever to cheat, well, if you're very, very clever to cheat, you could be spending the time to actually learn the material instead of trying to be clever to cheat. Um, but you might get away with it. You might not. Uh, and I don't want you to worry about Proctorio, Okay. Again, I, if it was up to me, I'd be giving you a different test, and I'd say it's open book but closed, uh, but you can only, but you can't talk to each other. So I'd give you an open book exam and say uh, go at it. But I design it to be an open book exam, right? There'd be no state the mean value theorem or state rules theorem proper uh, question about it. You'd have a lot of true faults that were kind of tricky that you really had to understand. You'd have a lot of problems that were like optimization problems where you actually really needed to understand the material in order to figure them out. Uh, but I'm not doing it. I'm not the person in charge of this whole thing. Uh, and the committee decided we were going with a Proctorio exam. So that's what we're doing. Are there any other questions about that? Good question. Okay. So that's how the exam's going to work. I'm going to try to make it as close to your regular exam experience as possible, given what we've got here. So how do we feel one to five about the what's going to happen on Saturday? Understanding what's going to happen on Saturday, one to five. Okay. There'll be a... a, a be a link to the test. The test is being pushed out on everybody at the exact same time. Uh, the link is actually on my personal website right now. If you went to it, you could actually find it if you so inclined. Uh, 
it's right here, you know, where it says test three 2020, um, and then it will say test three will be posted here. Um, so once the test is live, that link, that, that, that thing will be replaced with the actual test. Uh, and this way that there's no accident where one of the instructors uh, posts the entire test on their canvas for everybody to see. Uh, because, you know, if I have to write this test again, I'm going to go nuts. And I do mean crazy. Um, because that's happened before. Are there any other questions? Okay, so that's the test. Uh, and that's the quiz. Do we have any other questions, comments, issues, suggestions, thoughts? I assume that there are only actually 12 people still hanging out in the Discord thing. Um, one of the problems is that I actually don't know on, uh, on on Twitch. I actually don't know how many of the people watching are in my class. Um, so I got rated the other day. I actually have more followers than I have people taking my classes. Um, my total number of followers now on Twitch is greater than the number of people. Uh, yeah, so there's a question, will they curve the test? We're not planning on it. Uh, uh, I mean, the first test was an absolute disaster for most of the sections. Not for mine. I love you guys. Um, and because of that, uh, so if there was ever going to be a time to curve it, it would have been then. Um, and we didn't. So we'll look at the scores. I'm actually not that worried about you guys. Um, maybe I should be a little bit more, but I'm not. I, I've looked at, you guys are keeping up with the material. I've looked at the quizzes. I've looked at the, your notes. Um, you know, and, uh, I know you guys are incredibly nervous about it. Um, I'm a little nervous, but I looked at your stuff and I compared it with last year's and it seems like the online for most people have not been, you know, you know, it's the material getting to you. It's not the, it's not the fact that we're now online doing it. Uh, so I'm actually very proud of you guys, you know, adjusting to this online situation. Um, and the fact that you, that you guys have, um, uh, seemed to, you know, picked it up. Um, there's also a question about the Nego lecture. I have figured out what to do. I've got two options in my brain. Um, and I'm going to post those probably on Sunday. Um, uh, because I, I am going to do something for the extra credit point, uh, the Nego lecture point. Uh, I haven't figured out what yet. Um, part of it will depend on how much grading is left. Are there any other questions for me? Okay. So as I said, you guys seem to be struggling with the material, but actually struggling with the material, not the format of the material, which is, is, is actually not the not the delivery method, which is which is making me very proud. Um, so I, 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 I actually expect you guys to do about as well, if not better than normal on test three. Some of the other sections I'm a little worried about. Uh, but you guys seem to be shaping up pretty well. I'm very proud of this. Are there any other, you seem to have embraced the online more than the other sections. Um, I, I've looked at the, the views for the, the videos and, uh, you know, you guys seem to be watching them and seem to be uh, not falling behind. And I'm very happy about that. Are there any other questions? Okay. So let's go, let's talk about what we want to talk about today. Um, so this is material. I've never quite, uh, I've never done it quite this way. I, I usually introduce this function, but then I bury it. And what happens is that um, I, I'm trying something a little bit uh, different in the sense that I'm actually going to make a lot of this explicit that I don't. Um, so the stuff for today, the, the min max functions, okay. It's stuff that's part of module three, but that we never cover on the test. Sort of like that inverse stuff that I did the day before test two. Remember that I did, um, the day before we did test two, I did differentials, and I did a bunch of other stuff, right? Uh, it's kind of like that, um, in the sense that I'm doing something that is in the is supposed to be covered in module three, but never makes it on the test. But very important for module four, all right? 
And it kind of helps understanding what's going on in Module 3, but doesn't completely. Uh, if that answers your question. So it's not directly tested. I will have a quiz question on it for, for Module 4, um, but it's not directly on the test. So and I hope people just don't, like, turn off the video and say, okay, well, I'll do this, you know, for my notes next week. Uh, well, you can't because the notes are due on Friday. Ha, 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 I'm evil. You have to watch the video ahead of time. Um, so what we want to do today is we want to talk about two functions with fancy parameters. Now, just out of curiosity, um, how many of you have seen the movie Hunt for Red October? So, uh, how many people have seen the movie Hunt for Red October? Yeah. Okay. Well, you see, to me, to my, you know, my cohort, the people that were born between 1977 and 1983, Hunt for Red October is the fifth coolest movie made. This was the fifth coolest movie of, you know, it came out in 1990 at the very end of the Cold War, and it was the fifth greatest movie ever made, right? There was the Holy Trilogy, Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi. Then there was Top Gun, you know, jets, cool, Navy stuff. And then there was this movie, Hunt for Red October. Now, if you read the book, all right, I read the book uh, after watching the movie, and the book was a letdown. Because the movie itself is, 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 is the, the, way that, so the way that the book is, these two conflicts, he's built up the suspense the whole time, um, uh, Tom Clancy has in the book. But then he resolves the both of the major suspense items separately. And at different times, right? There's this large gap between this one getting resolved and this one getting resolved. So it's kind of like two stories that just kind of happen at the same time, but then one gets resolved and the other one kind of goes and then it gets resolved. And the way when they wrote the when when Larry Ferguson and Donald Stewart wrote the screenplay, okay, they did this brilliant thing, which is they made the two resolved at the exact same time. Right? So the KGB agent and the Akula class submarine that's hunting the Red October both get resolved within minutes of each other on the screen. And so there's all this tension as they happen at the same time. It's beautiful. And it makes the whole thing really nice. The fundamental theorem of calculus is like this. The way it's standardly presented, there's this bit in the fundamental theorem of calculus about the max and min. And if that's the first time that you see the max and min, that's what's confusing. So you miss this beautiful thing about the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is the, you know, the end goal of the class is to prove that thing. And you miss it. it it's kind of a letdown. Um, because the, the beauty of the whole proof is kind of shot by not understanding this thing ahead of time. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this piece that we need for the fundamental theorem of calculus that should be presented um, when we do the extreme value theorem. And we're going to kind of do it now so that when we get to the FTC, you've seen this before and you're not distracted by it. And it's this idea of the max and min functions. And they're both functions with parameters. Um, so let's talk about them. So what do I mean by parameters? Well, I'm going to define, let f be some function. So we're going to have let d, oops, that's a highlighter. And it's important here, when I say let D be some interval, I don't actually care if it's open or closed or whatever. I just need it to be some interval. Uh, yes, uh, you may feel old. Uh, uh, I really feel old. Um, so your homework for tonight, if you've never seen The Hunt for Red October, is go watch The Hunt for Red October. Of course, if you didn't grow up in the Cold War, you might not, you know, uh, you might not be able to relate to it uh, as easily. But it is there. Really good movie. So I want D to be some interval. Um, and let A be some number in D.
And we're going to call A is our base point. Okay. Let F Okay, so the things that are really important here is that D is some interval and that F is continuous. Those are the two pieces that are really key. Now, if that's the case, then I'm going to define this function. All right. How do we feel about that statement, one to five? I'm sort of asking sarcastically, right? This is psychotic. All right. We need an example. Uh, refresh. So if your video is blurry, go ahead and refresh Twitch. Uh, and it'll fix it. Yeah, you better be wanting me on this. This is psychotic. Okay, here's what I'm doing. What I'm doing, let's do an example. It's easier with an example. So this right here is the function. Let's do an example. f of x equals x cubed minus 2x uh, on, let's see, d equals negative infinity, infinity. So all the reals. Okay, and let's let a equal mm, 0 0.5. Yeah, we'll let A equal 1. Okay, so here's my base point. Right here, X equals 1. All right, so here's the question. What is max F1 of 1 1.5? What is the max, what is this function of 1.5? So what's the question I'm asking? If I wanted to evaluate max at 1.5, what's the question I'm asking? The question I'm asking, right? I'm going to throw that definition in there. What I'm asking is the max of F1 at 1.5 equals the max of f of t such that t is in the interval 1, which is a, 1.5. 
So how do we feel one to five about what the question's asking? When I want to evaluate max of F1 of 1.5, how do we feel now about what the question's asking me to find? Okay. So the question is asking, what is the maximum Y value between 1 and 1 1.5? And it's this one right here, right? It's 1. Because f of 1 is bigger than f of 1.5, and f of 1 is bigger than everything in between. Let's ask the exact same question again. What is the max f1 of eh, 1 point, uh, let's do 1 point, uh, 1.7. So what is that max? Well, it's not this, no. It's not negative 1, right? It's going to be bigger than that, because here, this is bigger. It's right there. So this max function, as I move to the right, away from my base point, it's there, it's there, but here, it gets bigger. How do we feel about that 1 to 5? What that function would be? Okay. So the point is that I trace the maximum value over the interval 1 to wherever my x value is. So I trace the maximum value over my interval from 1 to whatever my x value is. So right here, f of 1 is bigger, 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 bigger. But here, f of x becomes bigger than f of 1. So it shoots up and traces f again. Well, let's look at it from the left. What is max f1 of 0 0.5? So now I'm asking the other question. I'm asking this bit of the thing, right? x is less than a. So now I'm asking max f of t so that t is in the interval 0 0.5, 1. So is the maximum value down here on that interval? On this interval, what is the maximum value? f of what? Yeah, f of 0.5 is bigger. So here, this is the point. So my function is going to trace down, right? If I'm here, if I'm right here, this point, f of this point is bigger than, than is the biggest thing on this interval. If I'm here, it's the biggest thing in the interval. Here, it's the biggest thing on the interval. Now, at zero, of course, it, what's the biggest thing on this interval? f of what? What is max zero? Right, f of zero is the biggest thing in that interval. Now, 
what is the biggest thing on this interval? In other words, what is max f1 of negative 0 0.5? What's the biggest value? f of what? What is the biggest value from negative 0.5 to 1? The biggest value from negative 0.5 to 1. Yep. Zero. So my max function, when I'm less than zero, is going to trace this side out. Right? My max function is going to trace this stuff. How do we feel about that, 1 to 5? Okay. A little better. The numbers are improving a little bit. You may just be doing that to make me feel better, but I hope they're honest numbers. Let's look at the min function. All right. So my question is, what is min of uh, what is min f uh, uh, one of zero point five? All right. Is it going to be up here? Right. So I'm asking for what is the minimum on this interval? Okay. So what is the minimum on this interval? Bueller. Bueller. Ah, someone's typing. Okay. Well, yeah, it's this number right here. Negative 1 is the min because that happens at 1. So the minimum's down here. Right? The min is that point there. All right, what about the min f1 of 0? Well, that's still f of 1, isn't it? Matter of fact, that's f of 1 all the way to this point. And then, because I get smaller, my function is going to go down. All right, what's the minimum here at 1.2? Uh, Oops. That's going to be f of what? At 1.2, what's smaller? 
I'm asking for the min on this interval right here. Yeah, it's going to be f of 1.2. Yeah, that's about negative 1.2. Negative 1.15. Point is, it's about right here. So, as I move to the right, away from my base point, it's going to trace out. But here, it reaches the minimum. So, when it reaches the minimum, it's going to shoot straight off to the right. Because all of these values here, all of these values here are greater than all of these values. All these values here, right? All this F stuff here is greater than that point. So here it's going to shoot off to the right. But notice here it comes down and starts following the contour of F. How do we feel about that 1 to 5? Yeah, so is the min on the interval to the base point? It's still weird, isn't it? Let's do another example. Oops. Same function. Let's do it again. Uh, I want to use that later. Same function, different A value. Let's let our A value be 0.5. I think that's, let me make sure that I've got the right function. I think that's the graph of that function. Oh, no, sorry, this should be 2x squared. Doesn't matter. Well, it does on the graph though. Same D, but let's let A equals uh, one half. So now my anchor point is going to be this point right here. All right. Now, same question before. What is max uh, F? 0 0.5 of 1. So what is the maximum value of this interval? Is it down here? No. All right, it's not down there. It's here. Yes, A equals one half. Okay. Indeed, if I go all the way to 1.5, what's still my max? My max stays where it is, right? Here's my max, here's my max, here's my max, here's my max. But when I hit this value here, my max starts following the, the graph. Let's do the other side. What is the max of this uh, between this interval here? So what is max uh, 0? Well, here the max is going to be this point here, right? 
Exactly, f of 0. Alright. And look what happens here. Where is the max of all these points? What is it here? What is max f 0.5 of 1? Of negative 0.5. F of zero again, right? Matter of fact, that stays like it is. So I have this very interesting function. Min works the same way. Okay? Here my minimums are tracing. But here they stop. And they start going below, right? Here, all of these values are below. Here, all of these values are below the base. I'm sorry. All of these values are above my base point. So I'm going to trace there until I hit the graph. In which case, the graph becomes smaller here. Okay. How do we feel about that one to five now that I've done two examples? The purple line is the men. And the blue line is the max. Okay. Yeah, the numbers are going up a little. And this is very hard. This is a weird thing. But remember, you know, this is a, a function about a function. It's a function about a picture, as a matter of fact. And I wouldn't ask you to do these algebraically. They're a pain in the neck to do algebraically. But graphically, there's some really cool stuff going on here. So this function has two very cool properties. Okay. One, both are well-defined. Right, they both exist and they both define everywhere. Why is this true? This is true Not MVT, the extreme value theorem, Vastras, applies. Okay. That's the first one. One to five, how do we feel about that first property? That both of these functions are very well defined. And that's true because that f has to be continuous and these two things are closed intervals. Okay, and that means that it's defined everywhere. The second very cool property about this thing
Is it both? Functions, both min and max. are themselves continuous functions. How do we feel about that, 1 to 5? I'm not going to prove it. I'm just going to rely on this idea that this is intuitive, right? If, I, if, I, if I'm here and I switch from my... from my point, I do it continuously, right? So both of these functions are continuous as long as f is continuous. Uh, as long as f is continuous, I'm not jumping around. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So if I give you a problem like this, what I'm going to ask you to do is trace the things on graphs, okay? I'm not going to ask you to compute these things algebraically or anything. Uh, but it's a very interesting property. Uh, these things have two very interesting properties. And because of these functions, I, I'm setting up stuff that we're going to use for the fundamental theorem of calculus because it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and the other thing I'm doing is I'm kind of getting us the feel for what the next module is like. Even though this is really module three stuff, it's going to be these functions with base point. When we do the area under the curve function on Monday, uh, which will be the first thing we do in module four. When we do that on Monday, after we're coming back from the test, this is gonna be the stuff we're talking about. Uh, we're gonna talk about another function with parameters, the area under the curve. Um, and it's a beautiful function, and it's going to be, you're, you're, I'm going to trump it up, right? It's a beautiful function. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. They're going to love it, right? It's beautiful. It's just absolutely beautiful function. Um, so you're going to, the AUC is kind of cool. Um, and it, it's intimately involved with the fundamental theorem of calculus. So today we uh, went over the quiz and we went over the testing procedures. Again, epic fail on my part for not having uh, limit problems on there. I totally forgot. Um uh, the and then we went over these two functions, the min and the max, uh, which are functions with some fancy parameters. Uh, again, next time we'll talk about AUC, and uh, we have the test on Saturday. Uh, don't forget the uh, there's a study session tonight at five, study session tomorrow night at seven. I will be around pretty much all day tomorrow. Office hours will be changed on Friday. Uh, they will be in the afternoon, not in the morning, because I have to uh, help the uh. Uh, I have to do the discrete test. Any other questions, comments, issues, suggestions, and thoughts? Okay, well, that's it for me.